Welcome again to TEDx Amsterdam. We're still alive and kicking. The man next to me is a man with a mission to let people live healthy and happy until they're thousands. That's a long time. Aging is not a product of selection. Evolution is simply a product of evolutionary neglect. Biomedical gerontologist Aubrey de Grey believes our lifespan will soon extend itself dramatically to 1,000 years. However... Let's be honest. Getting old and decrepit sucks. So de Grey made a very detailed plan to rejuvenate us. After all, we don't really want to live forever. We just want to stay young. If you think that I'm wrong, you'd better damn well go and find out why you think I'm wrong. Does Aubrey de Grey play God? Or can we entrust our lives to this brilliant scientist? You shouldn't trust people who call themselves gerontologists. If we really want to do anything about the diseases of old age, the disabilities of old age, we've really got to do something about aging itself. Rather than trying to slow down the rate at which metabolism creates damage, or slow down the rate at which damage translates into pathology, let's instead just uncouple those two processes from each other by going in and periodically repairing the damage. Mr. Aubrey de Grey, are you God? I'm just a practical guy. I just don't like to see people getting sick. Mm -hmm. And I'm working to stop people from getting sick, however old they get. Maybe people will live a long time as a result, but that would just be a side effect. The key thing here that I'm interested in doing is stopping people from getting the diseases and disabilities that everybody gets if they get old enough at the moment. Mm -hmm. And is this your life work? At the moment, it's my life work. I have been working on this for about 15 years, and it looks like I'll be working on it for a little bit longer. Uh, before I did this, I was working on another humanitarian goal, artificial yeah. intelligence, but this is my life's work at the moment. H how, how old will you get? I think that people who are currently in their 40s, which I am, have maybe a 50% chance of benefiting from the sorts of therapies that I'm hoping to develop. Mm -hmm. That's because I think we have a fair chance of developing those therapies within the next 25 years or so, yeah. and the therapies will work on people who are already in middle age or maybe even a little older. Mm -hmm. But is it then reasonable to have children? I think that the question of how many children we have in the future when yeah. we have the ability to avoid aging is going to be a question that humanity of that time should decide for itself. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we simply don't know the technological context, the societal context within which society will be able to make the choice between a high death rate and a low birth rate. Yeah. So we need to give them that choice by developing these therapies. Mm -hmm. So when I listen to you, 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 you talk quite fast but I was capable of listening very well, maybe the verb to die will disappear out of I the vocabulary, in I a sense. I think it's very important to remember that I only work on eliminating one cause of death. Mm -hmm. I'm not working on stopping people from being hit by trucks. No. So there will certainly be plenty of ways in which people will die, just as young adults who are not susceptible to death from aging mm -hmm. occasionally die today. The rate of death will be lower, but it will not be zero. Mm -hmm. And y you talked about the, the fact that the medical paradigm is a wrong paradigm because it treats people when they're ill. I think that for most purposes, it does make sense to treat people when they're sick. Mm -hmm. But aging has the difficulty that it is so complicated. That there are so many different things that go wrong at more or less the same time and they interact with each other. So it is simply too intricate, too complicated to try to treat those, one, those diseases one at a time. It is going to work much better to do what we might call preventative geriatrics yeah. and treat the causes of those diseases, which are still quite complicated, but not nearly so complicated as the diseases themselves. And how many times do I have to go to the prevention clinic then? I th think that the frequency with which people will need these if you like, repair and maintenance mm -hmm. therapies, will probably change over time, but I think it would be reasonable to expect to go in perhaps once every 10 years. Yeah, but with all due respect, I really think, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, like, I like your ideas, I, b I believe you, I really do, but I think that there are a lot of people that don't believe you, are very critical towards your quite fresh ideas. Uh, 
I think that people are afraid of living, not of dying. Could this be true? Well, there are a lot of reasons why people are resistant to these ideas. Some people think, well, it will just not be possible. People have been trying to defeat aging for thousands of years, and they have never done it, so we probably never will do it. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the same for every technology until we succeed. So it's not a sensible way to think about this. You have to look at the details in order to understand really whether we are close to developing technologies that will work. Other people are scared of thinking about aging because they don't want to get their hopes up. Mm -hmm. Or they're scared of thinking about it um, because their parents are scared of thinking about it and they just don't want to think. You know, there are lots of bad reasons to be resistant to the defeat of aging, but there are no good reasons. Mm -hmm. you're, you're the chief uh, science officer of the SENSE Foundation. How, how is that foundation funded? We receive our funding at the moment almost exclusively from philanthropy, from okay. individuals who simply give us money to spend and to give out again to scientists to get the work done. How much money do you need? We need perhaps 20 or 50 times as much as we have. Mm -hmm. Our budget this year is only $2 million. And I certainly would not run out of ideas for how to spend money usefully on this research until we were up around $50 million. Mm -hmm. And how big is the organization currently? At the moment, we fund about a total of between 15 and 20 people. Uh, that's including people who work for the foundation mm -hmm. and people who work in universities on research that we mm -hmm. support. And, and can you make it very concrete, those 20, 25 people? What, what do they do? What's their output? How are they going to resolve this thing? How will they influence government, the culture, the people, the medical culture towards this goal, rejuvenation? Most of these people are researchers. They are in the laboratory developing the technologies that we will put together mm -hmm. to make comprehensive rejuvenation. In the first instance, perhaps in as little as six or eight years, I hope, we will be able to do this in mice in the laboratory. Yeah. And what I mean by do this, I mean that we will be able to take middle-aged mice in, who, in, w in whom nothing has been done before, no genetic modifications to their parents, no lifelong dietary or pharmacological mm -hmm. in, uh, in interventions, just take these middle-aged mice, do a whole lot of things to them that repair them, that rejuvenate them so that they are biologically things, things, younger again. Things like? Stem cell therapies, gene therapies, probably some vaccines, perhaps some pharmaceuticals as well, lots of things all at the same time mm -hmm. that fix all of the various types of damage that accumulate during aging. And the purpose of this will be to extend the healthy lifespan of these mice. Once we can do that a lot, perhaps give them an extra couple of years of healthy life, yeah. it will be, be a, really a, as good as a proof that it's only a matter of time before we can do the same thing for humans and give them maybe 30 years of extra life. Mm -hmm. So people will be convinced that it's not a pipe dream anymore and my job will be more or less done. Everyone else will get on with it and there will be no shortage of money and so on. Okay. Um, given the fact that, well, under the assumption that this will happen one day, uh, you probably also told about the fact that uh, if, if you look at France, people are striking because they want to raise the pension age from 60 to 62. How to cope with that? I, I mean, uh, the, the whole concept of getting old mm -hmm. has to change then. Exactly. So if we think about what happened a couple of years ago with the meltdown of the global economy, yeah. an enormous amount of money was spent and governments more or less got away with it. It was electorally acceptable, politically acceptable, mm -hmm. because everybody knew that there was a crisis. The problem is when things change very gradually, no one thinks there is a crisis. And so it's politically very difficult to make any changes, even if all the political parties agree that it, the changes need yeah. to be made. It's going to be the same with this. When we get these technologies, or even when people begin to realize that the technology are, t technologies are coming quite soon, we will be able to make whatever changes we need to rebuild things like the pensions concept from mm -hmm. the ground up. I mean, let's face it, the only reason that we currently are willing to pay people from the age of 65 or whatever to do nothing for the rest of their lives is because we're very sorry for them. And yeah. we're very sorry for them because they're about to get sick and die. And so when that's not true anymore, the whole social contract between the generations mm -hmm. changes. And I'm not saying that retirement will necessarily be eliminated, but it will become a periodic thing. You know, you'll be a journalist for 40 years, and then, you know, you'll retire on your savings or on a public pension maybe, for, but you won't retire forever, only for maybe 10 or 20 years. And then you start again. And you start again, that's right. And you'll want to start again, because, you know, golf will have lost its novelty value if you're still able to keep up with your granddaughter on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like fun. I think so. It sounds like fun. 
Okay, cool. You're here for a whole day yes. uh, in Amsterdam uh, visiting uh, TEDx. Uh, I, I assume you enjoyed it, but, but what was your highlight? What was your moment uh, of inspiration until now? It's certainly been an excellent conference. Absolutely outstanding. Very high quality of speakers across the whole board, so it's extremely difficult to choose. I guess if I had to choose one speaker whose work I find particularly inspiring, it's probably Anita Goll, whose work on the merging of nanotechnology with mm -hmm. biotechnology has, in my view, enormous potential to benefit medicine in general and you know, um, yeah. you know, biotechnology in general. It's quite close to your life work, I think. I guess that, yeah, it's a bit parochial because I certainly understand what she's doing mm -hmm. pretty well and I understand the value of it, so I guess maybe that's part of it. Thank you very much for this interview. My Probably. pleasure.